main gods of Satan. That's where we are. Um, I've been trying, I don't know if you've gotten it, I don't know if I've made it clear enough, but I've been walking through the history of Israel, and the point of it is to see that every step Israel tries to move, uh, when Yahweh says to do something, Satan is always there with the counterfeit to say, no, 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 don't do that, do this instead. Everywhere Israel moved from Egypt, God defeated all the, through the ten plagues, God can. can he defeated all of the uh, Egyptian gods, and yet here was Satan. Do it this way. Do it this way. Even before Egypt gets to the promised land, uh, being lured by what they learned in Egypt with all the, uh, all the idolatry, even before they got to the promised land, we've looked at the fact that Israel went out there into the, into the plains of, uh, of uh, Mount Sinai, and they made themselves a golden calf. Satan's always there with the counterfeits. They made the golden calf. They worshipped it. Forty years later, we see that Israel finally went into the land. We talked about this. And there is Satan with his counterfeits already made up. The Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perishites, the Gergesites, the Jebusites, all these nations that were in the promised land, Satan already had them ginned up with all their false gods. They were waiting for Israel to get there so that they could intermarry and Satan could tempt Israel, the Jewish men, to intermarry, and it worked. And all the men started worshiping all the false gods of Canaan. Uh, worship of Baal Peor, remember all the, uh, the, the lascivious, the men of Israel taking the Moabite women even before they went into the promised land. There Satan dangling the women, trying to get Israel's attention off the, off the worship of Yahweh the Jewish God, and he's so successful. They go into Canaan, they intermarry, There's, they are, there are plentiful satanic gods, Canaanite gods waiting for them to lure their attentions away from Yahweh, Baal and Asherah. We talked about them among other gods, even though, even though Israel committed to Yahweh to be uh, faithful to him. Look what the Bible says again in Joshua chapter 24. They've come into the land. They've defeated the uh, Canaanite gods partially. <coughs> and there are the satanic counterfeits waiting. But when they go into the land at the end of Joshua's life, Joshua tells the people, listen, you've got to choose. Yahweh's not pleased with this, worshiping Him and worshiping these false gods. He says He will have no other gods beside Him or in His midst. It's not okay to worship Yahweh and to also, at the same time, worship false gods. God doesn't play that game. So Joshua says to them, you've got to choose. Either worship Yahweh, the Jewish God, the only God, or choose to worship all these false gods, but you've got to make a call. And Israel responded to Joshua in Joshua chapter 24, verse 16. The people said, the Jewish people, far be it from us that we should forsake Yahweh to serve other gods. What does that mean? We won't do that. Which is exactly what they did, though. Far be it from us that we should forsake our God, the only God, Yahweh, to serve other gods. For Yahweh, our God, the Jewish God is the God who brought us and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt. They understood what He had done for them from the house of slavery or bondage. He's the God who did these great signs in our sight, the ten, command, or the ten plagues, and preserved us through all the way. Think about the, the Red Sea parting, the... Um, thank you, Polly. The Red Sea parting and the, um, the water in the wilderness, the manna that came down every evening... All of those things, that are the, the ways that God preserved Israel as they went through the way in which we went and among all the peoples through whose midst we passed. So Israel says, God has done tremendous things for us. He's shown that He's the only God. We saw Him defeat all the Egyptian gods. There's no way we would ever turn away from this God. And they meant it. But they were lured away very quickly. The next verse says, The Lord drove out. They continue on what God has done for them. Yahweh drove out from before us, the Jews, all the Canaanite peoples, even the Amorites who lived in the land. Yahweh did this for us. He kicked them out of the land. He gave us their cities, their houses, their crops, their trees. He gave us everything. 
We will also, because of what He's done for us, we will serve Yahweh, for He, Yahweh, is our God. And in a very short amount of time, as soon as Joshua was dead and his generation died, the Bible says that Israel turned and started worshiping the false gods who they so passionately hear say, there's no way we'll ever turn away from our God. He's proven himself to us. We'll never leave him. You go on in Israel's history throughout the book of Judges. Remember, this is Joshua. The next book in the Bible is Judges. And throughout the book of Judges, whenever Israel practiced idolatry, remember the cycle of the Judges? They would practice idolatry. God would bring a Gentile nation to, to disturb them. They would finally, Israel would finally get the message. They'd cry out to God, please save us, and God would lift up a judge. So here's my statement. Whenever Israel practiced idolatry, God allowed another nation to oppress them. That's what he did. That's part of the cycle of the judges. He did not grant them victory over these groups while they were unfaithful to him. Unless they were worshiping Yahweh properly, they were being disciplined by God and they had a Gentile nation above them. But as I also said, whenever Israel cried out to Yahweh, Yahweh would demonstrate His power over all the other gods by sending a judge to rescue Israel. That was God versus Satan's false gods. He would show Himself stronger than the other nations and their gods by saving Israel over and over and over. Now we're looking at Yahweh versus the satanic Philistine gods because they go into Canaan, they live in the land of Canaan. And if you'll notice, in the land of Canaan where all the Jews lived, this is these, I've shown you this a thousand times, all these names, all these colors are the 12 tribes of Israel. This is where they settled. But down here you see this name Philistines. The Philistines were a sea people that came in from islands, uh, uh, Cyprus probably in the, uh, in the Mediterranean Sea and they settled here in this area and they simply overpowered Israel and they settled along the coast. Part of the Philistine territory is what we know, uh, know, know today as the Gaza Strip. That's ancient Philistine territory. That's where they were, right where Gaza is. So we've transferred over. We've looked at God beating the Egyptian gods. We've looked at God beating the golden calf. We've looked at God beating the worship of Baal, uh, Peor. We've looked at God beat the satanic Can uh, Canaanite gods. And now we're on to the Philistine gods. What is God going to do to show himself superior over the Philistine gods that Satan has propped up? Two accounts in the Bible we're going to look at. We're going to look at one of them tonight. We'll look at the next one on, on Sunday, on Wednesday. We go to Carriage Inn on Sunday. Two accounts. Number one is Satan's god, Dagon. Remember the half man, half fish god, Dagon, uh, versus Yahweh's Ark of the Covenant. When they bring, we'll talk about this tonight, when they bring the Ark of the Covenant in and they put it in this temple to the Philistine god, Dagon, we're going to see how that works out for the Philistines. How God, Yahweh, shows His power over the Satan's counterfeit Philistine gods. And then we're going to look at King David versus the giant, uh, the giant named Goliath. Where was Goliath from? He was a Philistine. He was from Philistia. He was from the city of Gath, Gat. He is a Philistine. So we'll see how God defeats Goliath to show that He has power over Goliath's gods, the Philistine gods. So this is where we are. That's the map of uh, Israel, and those are the Philistines where they exist. A few decades, now listen to the timeline just quickly, a few decades, maybe almost a hundred years. So almost a hundred years before King David took the throne, in approximately 1104 B.C., the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant of God. They captured the Ark of the Covenant and they brought that Ark into their territory. It left the area. I've got a map in a second. I'll show you. It left the area up here and went down into the Philistine cities and start made, started making its rounds in the Philistine cities and destroying them. We'll talk about that in just a second. But before we get into that story, I want to show you two verses. 
even the Philistines, even the enemies of God, the enemies of Israel, the enemies of Yahweh, even the Philistines, the Gentile, false God-worshipping, satanic Philistines, even they understood that they needed to treat the Ark of the Covenant of God in a special way. Look what the Scripture says in 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 7. When they had the Ark, remember the war was going on. There was a battle between Israel and the Philistines, and the Jews were losing many, many men, and they decided, the elders of the Jews decided, if we go get the Ark of the Covenant from the tabernacle in Shiloh, and we bring the Ark into the battle... It'll be like a good luck charm for us. God will be with us and we'll start beating the Philistines. 1 Samuel chapter 4. When the Philistines saw the ark of Yahweh come into the battle zone, this was their response. The Jews, obviously, let's, let's contrast this. The Jews weren't afraid of bringing the ark out of the temple, out of the tabernacle. The Jews had no regard for it. They treated it like a good luck charm. The Philistines were terrified by it because they knew that God had come with it. The Philistines were afraid for they said God has come into the camp. They knew it. They said, woe to us for nothing like this has happened before. And the next verse says, woe to us who shall deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods. They understand that that Ark of the Covenant is a worship, a piece of worship furniture for Israel, and they understand that the gods are at war here. They're brighter than the Jews on this day. They understand the war between Yahweh and Satan. They understand their god, Dagon, is being challenged by Israel's god, Yahweh. They get that. Israel just brings it in like a good luck charm. But these... These wicked, evil, non-Yahweh-worshipping Philistines at least understood what was going on that day on the battlefield. It says, and listen to how well the Philistines knew the history of Israel. It says, these are the gods, and we know him as one god, Elohim. But the Philistines said, these are the gods who killed the Egyptians. They smote the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. They knew Israel's history. They knew what God had done to the, to the gods in Egypt. And they were afraid of this God. Should they have been? Yes. But in, uh, instead of doing anything about it, all they did was encourage each other, uh, fight like a man, We all these kinds of things. To be, to be captured by Israel would be terrible. We need to fight to the death. And they, and they went up against the Jews and God gave the ark into the hand of the Philistines. But even the Philistines, what I'm trying to show you is even these people made in the image and likeness of God a people group that God no doubt wants to be saved. God desires that all men be saved, right? There's no question about that. Even these people recognized that there are, worship, there are multiple gods to worship. There are choices. And we may be on the wrong side of this because that God, the Jewish God, that's a powerful God. At least they knew that part. And now this ark that represents the presence of the Jewish God is present on the battlefield. They were scared to death. A couple of verses later, it says this, 1 Samuel 4.10, So the Philistines fought. I tell you, they girded themselves up. They encouraged each other. We've got to fight. We can't lose to Israel. So this is what happened. The Philistines fought. Israel was defeated. So the good luck charm didn't work, did it? The Ark of the Covenant being brought onto the battlefield, Israel thinking, oh, God will surely give us the, the victory. Now we have His Ark with us. didn't work at all, at all. It says Israel was defeated. Every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great, for there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. And the Ark of God was taken. It was bad enough that Israel removed this precious, the most precious piece of worship furniture to ever be on our earth. 
is that Ark of the Covenant right there. And it was bad enough that Israel had a low enough esteem for what this represented that they would take it out to the battlefield. It was bad enough that that occurred, but now it's even worse because this Ark of the Covenant has left Jewish land and gone into Gentile land. Not only is it not in the tabernacle, but now it's not in Israeli territory. It's been captured. It says, The ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. We're trying to find out what's God going to do about this. The topic is Yahweh versus satanic gods. How is Yahweh going to do this? Israel has abandoned him. The ark has been, by, by parading him around like a lucky charm, Israel's abandoned him. Now the Philistines have taken this ark and they're about to put it in a temple to a false satanic god. How is God going to respond? Does he need men to fight his battles for him or not? What's the answer? No, he does not. We're about to find out. So here we go. Uh, this is a map. Here's the Dead Sea down here. Here's Jerusalem just to put a... Uh, this is right here where Gaza is, where I showed you the Philistines are. That, that's this curve right here is the coast right here. So um, the, the ark was taken from Shiloh. It was taken by the Jews to Ebenezer. It was fought over. It was captured by uh, the Philistines at Afek, at the Battle of Afek. They brought it down to Ashdod. They brought it into their territory and in Ashdod, they put it in the temple to a false god. They put it in the temple of Dagon. Look what the scripture says. Israeli army at Ebenezer, the Philistine army at Aphek. I told you that. Look what the Bible says about what happened with this ark. There's not a Jew in sight. They're in Philistine territory. Can God speak in the midst of Philistine territory when there's not a Jew to speak for him? Not a prophet, not a judge, no one to speak for him. Can God do his own speaking? Yes, he surely can. The Philistines took the ark of God. Remember, just to say one more thing about the ark, remember the ark is where the... the it, would, it was housed in the back section of the tabernacle in the, in the 10 foot by 10 foot section called the Holy of Holies. And above the ark, the mercy seat, is where God's presence would be. It was from above the ark where the temple of cloud, uh, the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire, that's where they emanated. It's like a rainbow. You ever try to find the end of a rainbow? If you saw God's pillar of cloud in Israel, you could find the end of it. The end of it was right on top of this box. This is the mercy seat, this lid on the ark, and it's right here that that pillar emanated from. It was cloud in the daytime. It was fire at night. It was the presence of God on earth. That's where he chose to make his presence, above that box, that acacia wood box, covered with gold. It's the most holy relic on earth. And Israel has brought it out to the battlefield. Maybe it'll be lucky. Astounding. The Philistines took God's ark and they brought it up from Ebenezer to Ashdod. And the Philistines took the ark of God and they brought it to the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. Here's a picture of a uh, uh, an artist's rendition of what Dagon would look like. Dagon was this half fish, half god, uh, half man, half fish. He was the national god of the Philistines. Who's our national god? Who's the god of the United States of America? If you believe in God in this nation, what's his name? It's Yahweh. That's who our God is. It's what our documents were founded on. Uh, it's what the Constitution, it's what the Declaration of Independence was founded on. We believe that our, we are endowed by our Creator. And our Creator as Americans is Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If you went to Philistia, into the land of the Philistines, and asked them, 
thousands of years ago, who is your nation's God? They would say, he is Dagon. He is our national God. That's who this man is, this false God, this God that they worship. He is the false but national God of the Philistines. If you ask the Canaanites, who is your national God? Who's the God of your nation? They would say Baal and Asherah. Those are the co-gods of the nation of Canaan, of the people of Canaan. Yes, the Ammonites. Yeah, they, they would say Milcom. If yes, the Moabites, they would give another name. All these people had their own set of gods. But they were all just differently named gods. They were all the same set of satanic gods with all different names. But this Dagon, the Philistines say, we've got treasure. We've got this piece like a trophy that we won from the, from the uh, Jews. And we're going to go set it down in front of Dagon like he's victorious over it. And he has conquered the Jewish god Yahweh. We're going to take it to him like a trophy and like a prize. Again, not a Jew in sight to argue. Only God, Yahweh, and this false god Dagon, alone in a room. Alone in a room. When the Ashdodites, who had presented to their great fierce god Dagon, when the Ashdodites, the people of Ashdod, when they arose early the next morning, behold, Dagon their God had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and they set him in his place. Can you imagine that? Yahweh falling down and little old you has to prop him back up because he's too frail, he's too weak, he's too uh, uh, incapable of taking care of himself through the night. But this is the God you worship, but you've got to go lift him up and put him back on his pedestal. Astounding what happens here. Remember, throughout the night, there's no one in this temple except for the false God Dagon and the presence of God himself, the Ark of the Covenant. Who fought this battle? Who fought the battle through the night? Whose battle was it? Who knocked Dagon over? Not a Jew in sight, not a Philistine in the temple. Can Yahweh fight his own battles? He does it throughout the whole book. He does it throughout the whole book. Sometimes he uses men like Joshua. Other times he tells armies like that that was following Joshua, listen, I don't want you to lift a finger. I'll take care of this one. You march around the city seven days in a row, and on the, on the seventh day you march around it seven times, and at the end of that you blow the trumpets, the shofars, have the police, priests blow the trumpets, have the people scream out loud, and I will destroy Jericho myself. I'll do it. Does God need men to fight his battles? No. Are we privileged as men and women, as Christians, to fight God's battles when he calls us to do it? Absolutely. But he doesn't need us to do it. He doesn't need us. And on this night, it was Satan, Satan versus God. Satan versus Yahweh. Yahweh versus Satan's God, Dagon. And we see how it happened. What happened the next night? So they prop him up. Everything is fine. They wake up the next morning. Yahweh has spoken even louder. But when they arose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face. He'd fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. Can you get that posture? Can you understand that? The picture I'm about to show you is wrong. Let me show it to you. Why is that wrong? He's, he's on his back, not on his face. If you were to worship a god, have you ever seen in movies where they get down on their knee and they do something like this and they bow their face before the king they're in front of? What has Dagon just done? What has Satan just been forced to do? Bow down and worship me. What does the Bible say in Philippians chapter 2 about our great God Jesus Christ? That one day what? Every knee... Every knee will bow. Every knee will fall on its face before the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll do it with tears in our eyes, thanking Him for saving us. The lost world will do it with tears in their eyes, not, not it being just totally disturbed by the fact that they didn't understand that this was right, that they chose to forsake this truth that Jesus is their Savior all their lives. 
every knee will bow. And on this day, God forced Dagon, Satan's man, on the job to fall down on his face. It's the same as Yahweh saying, Satan, I win. Get down before me. You bow in my presence. I love it. Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off. No power stripping him of his power. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. That's what happens when God is left alone with the false god. Can God beat Satan? That's it right there. Gail said it exactly right. You can get no better than that statement. My question was, can God beat Satan? And her answer was, every time. It's as simple as that. Every time is the answer. The Philistines, Dagon on the ground. Yahweh showed His power over Satan's imaginary Philistine God here by causing Dagon, His statue, to fall before the ark as if it was worshiping Yahweh. My Jews have left me. They abandoned me. They brought me out like a lucky, like a, like a rabbit's foot. Thought they could rub it, bring this my most holy relic into their presence on the battlefield and I would do something for them. That's not the way I work. That's not proper worship. And so they've abandoned me to the Philistines and here I am in front of this false satanic God and I rule no matter what I'm around. I rule. And everything will bow down to me. I will make it. So this fall is a crushing defeat of the false Philistine god Dagon. Yahweh, the God of Israel, the one true God. We know that God is the only God. He's the only creator. He's the sovereign ruler of all His creation. And He proves it on this day. Even, I showed you this before just as as an aside. Can you read the words in it? The stones will cry out. The Pharisees tell Jesus when His disciples, when He's coming into Jerusalem for His last time, when He's coming in on a donkey and and the disciples that Jesus had, His followers, His students, were saying, Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna means save us now. Save us today, Lord. Be the King of Israel. Wipe away the aggression of the Romans. Save us today. Save us now is what... Uh, Hosanna means, and that's what they were crying out to Jesus, their king, as he's entering into Jerusalem the week before he was crucified. The Pharisees hear all these, uh, these disciples crying out to Jesus, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the scribes, the lawyers tell Jesus, you shut these people up. You can't come into this city with people worshiping you like God. You shut these people up. And what was Jesus' answer? If I shut the people up, the stones will cry out. I created all of this. And you've got to remember that there was a day when before the false god Dagon who was carved out of stone, there was a day that he and I were alone and he bowed down to me. My my creation understands. Even an inanimate object like a, a rock that has no mind, a stone that has no brain to think with, yet even the stones, Jesus said, the stones would start to cry out and praise me if the people stopped. Everything will worship God. Everything should worship God. Uh, And Jesus Jesus makes it very clear in His statements there coming into the city of Jerusalem. So what happens here in the temple of Dagon is obvious. Yahweh, the one true God, shows His superiority over Satan's false gods. The Philistines, they come into the land. Satan has false gods that the Philistines bring with them. These false gods uh, tempt Israel. These false gods, Dagon is being worshipped by the Philistines. God knocks him down. He knocked out the Egyptian gods by the plagues. He knocked out the golden calf. He knocked out the Baal of Peor uh, gods, Satan. He knocked out the Moabite gods, the Ammonite gods. He knocked out the Canaanite gods. And here we are at Philistia when Philistia and Satan says, Oh, I've got a new god. Satan, uh, uh, the Lord Yahweh shows up and crushes that god. And we'll see throughout Israel's history as we move from this to Goliath, Goliath is going to taunt the armies of the living God. You can't listen to your king. There's nobody in Israel that can defeat me. 
your God is not strong enough to defeat me. What's Yahweh going to say? Watch me do it. I'm going to use a little bitty boy with one stone to destroy your entire army. One stone. You think I'm not powerful enough? God, and I'll show you next week also when... Uh, or the week after that, when we get into the idea of God versus the uh, Assyrian gods, that he gets very, very offended when somebody says, uh, God is, this, this Jewish God is only strong here. But if we fight the Jewish God in a different location, he's not the God over there and we can overcome him. I'll show you the verses, but here's the idea. When they get into Assyria, the Assyrians, uh, Ben Hadad is the king of Aram who's going against Israel. Uh, king Ahab is the king of the north in Israel. And the Assyrians say, Yahweh is a God of the mountains. That's why we can't beat Israel when we fight them in the mountains. Because their God is a God of the mountains. What we need to do is lure them down into the valley because their God is not a God of of the valleys. And to that, your God, Christian, took offense and said, I will show you that I'm the God who created all of it. And he destroyed Ben Hadad and his army there. And he did it alone. Because when you taunt the armies of the living God, you're taunting God. And when you taunt God directly and say, you may have power there, but you come down here and we'll crush you, you better watch out because God will respond on those days. He does it all the time in this book. Uh, Goliath will find out. The Assyrians will find out. Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon will find out. You try to cross the living God, he'll make you march around for seven years like a like a like a cow, like he did Nebuchadnezzar. You watch him bring you to your knees. He can do it. That's all for tonight. Next time, Goliath and his Philistine giant, or the Philistine giant Goliath against the little red-headed boy from Bethlehem, David. Let's close in prayer.